Good evening, welcome to Central News for Monday the 16th of December. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Christmas Children's Appeal encourages members of the Hamilton community to leave a wrapped gift under the Waikato Museum, Museum's Christmas tree from the 1st to the 20th of December for the children and families in the care of the Women's Refuge and Salvation Army. The appeal is just one of the great events happening at the Waikato Museum over the Christmas and summer period. Waikato Museum's Louise Bilay says the team are blown away by the generosity of people in Hamilton. The Children's Christmas Appeal is going really well. It's only just started and we've already got quite a few gifts under our trees. So we're looking forward to um, rewarding the families involved with Women's Refuge and Salvation Army um, while we're collecting up until the 20th of December. Motorists are being urged to create breathing space when driving this summer in a new road safety campaign to reduce the risk of crashes in the Waikato. Waikato Regional Council's Road Safety Coordinator, Monique Haynes, says driving on Waikato roads can be particularly challenging. So in this new campaign rolling out across the region this next week, they're encouraging motorists to create breathing space. The Multimedia Creating Breathing Space campaign is being driven by the Waikato Regional Road Safety Education Group. To tie in with its launch, a competition is being run on the reducetherisk.co.nz website. Now for our region's weather. Hamilton, your Tuesday will have morning showers and then fine spells in the afternoon. Your expected high is 24 and an overnight low of 11. Tauranga, you will have showers too and they will clear in the evening. Your expected high is 25 and an overnight low of 13. Just ahead, staying safe in the great outdoors this summer. Welcome to Central News on TV Central. Summer is finally here and the call of the outdoors is beckoning. But before heading out, Mountain Safety Council recommends you go through a checklist. John Greenwood, a bushcraft instructor with Mountain Safety Council, caught up with Harriet to share some tips. So John, when tramping, how important is it to check your gear every year? Well, it's a, it's a great um, thing to do to go tramping. It's really wonderful to be out in the forest like this, um, in nature. But if, unless you're prepared well, it can become a real miserable time. And for me, it starts with my footwear. I, uh, I like to make sure that I've got good boots and I wear good socks inside them. Um, thin cotton socks are not enough and uh, some people will actually wear two pair of socks. And uh, I've got found some really good thick socks, that, thick woolen socks that are great. And they give me good comfort. But even then, if you're wearing relatively new boots and you're going a long way, it is possible to get blisters. So in your first aid kit, you need to take some blister plasters, special things that you can put on them, because they're magic when you do that. I've had the experience of blistering my heels one year, and uh, a guy gave me a, a blister plaster, and it was like magic on my heel. So you have to have a good gear. Having it, and talking about that, you've got to have a first aid kit. So um, I always carry a first aid kit. I always carry a personal one, but if there's more than one of us, we take a party first aid kit. A little bit more comprehensive, a bit more gear. Personal one's got a bit of a bandage and, uh, and some plasters. Because the things you're going to do mostly is cut your finger or something stupid like that. The, the other important piece of equipment that is an absolute necessity is good waterproof gear. And I, I have a, a, a good parker, good quality parker, um, and uh, it, I never go anywhere without it. And it's, it's made of good quality material. It'll keep the water out. Although, let's be fair, if it's really hard work, you're probably gonna get just as wet on the inside from perspiration. Uh, but these breathe and they're very good. And I always carry waterproof trousers as well so I can keep warm and I can keep dry. Most important. And what are some of the most common mistakes that people make when they're tramping or hiking? The, the first and most common one, uh, Harriet, is that they fail to tell people accurately where they're going. And in, from Mountain Safety Council's point of view, we advise people to use what we call a help sheet. And it's, a, it's an intentions form. And um, these are available online on the, on the Mountain Safety website, or you can pick them up from sports shops. 
you just fill in where you're going, what you're going to do, who you are, and when you're going to come out, including details about your motor vehicle and what equipment you've got, so that if you don't come out and you've got into trouble, someone can tell the police and they can initiate search and rescue and you'll be found. And uh, that's the most important one. The second most important one is people fail to look behind them while they're going forwards. And if you don't look behind you, you don't know what it looks like when you turn to come back. And it's really important in my view, um, every couple of minutes along the track or wherever you're walking, that you look behind you and make sure you can identify where you've come from and where you're gonna go when you go back. Those are the main ones. And of course, not having the right equipment is part of that too. Now tell us how to be safe when it comes to crossing rivers. Well, rivers um, are more likely to cause fatalities of people in the bush than anything else. And we know very clearly that that's fact from the uh, statistics that mountain safety have accumulated over a very long period of time. And the, the most important thing is to make sure that the river is, you're going to cross is at a place where it is so flowing smoothly and, and slowly enough to get across, that it is not too deep, in other words, not more than about up to the top of your legs. Some people say not more than above your knees. Well, I think that's a bit too conservative, but up, if, if it's up around the top of your legs, you're okay. And we recommend people uh, cross in a group, linked together with your arms around each other, holding onto the pack on either side of them. And you keep your pack on your back because your pack is your life jacket. It will actually float you and we've actually proved this numerous occasions now and only a week ago I had a group of people out doing practice in the, uh, up in the Ohinemuru River and they were floating down quite happily on their packs down through a rapid until they could quietly paddle themselves out. And so it's important to keep in pair and to not cross a river that is in flood, that is if it's discoloured water if there's rubbish flowing in it, like bits of trees flowing down it, or if it's, the water is travelling faster than you can walk quietly alongside it. So if you throw a piece of water, a, a stick into the water and walk alongside it, if it goes faster than you're going, you shouldn't be going into the river. And are there courses that people can take that will help them to stay safe? Yeah, the, uh, the first and, and most important one is uh, if, you, if someone wants to um, go for a good long tramp, come and do one of our river safety courses. We all, if we can get eight people, we'll do one at any time. Um, it's a really a good thing to do to do a bushcraft course, at least an introductory bushcraft, where you can learn a little bit about navigation, how to use a compass, um, how to find your way around in the forest. And uh, they're available regularly but also outdoor first aid, which we uh, run courses on, which is a bit more detailed. It talks about um, outdoor first aid if you're not likely to get help in 24 hours, rather than having an ambulance there in five minutes or whatever, if you're doing it in town. And then um, the, the third thing um, is really important. We run the courses regularly called risk management, and they're very intense over two days and you'll learn about what risk is and how to manage it. And what's the best way to cope with emergencies? The best thing to do before you start, take one of these things with you. It's called a personal locator beacon, and uh, this one belongs to Mountain Safety Waikato. And if you set this off, a, uh, it will be picked up by an aircraft um, or by uh, electronic means in very short period and they can locate exactly where you are and help is on its way. Best thing you can ever have. If you would like to attend a course on tramping safety or any other outdoors topic, visit mountainsafety.org.nz. Just ahead, we look at more sustainable land use. Welcome back. Recent rain has squashed the predictions of a possible drought, but should we still be exploring more sustainable methods of farming? 
I caught up with Waikato Federated Farmers representative recently, Stu Wadley, to talk about drought and the effects on animals. It certainly does. Uh, when a drought comes in, you certainly the mo mo most important thing is water. 90% of our body is water, it's the same animal. So water is, is an important animal welfare issue. Certainly heat exhaustion is, and so you do all the management on the farm to, uh, uh, to mitigate that. And of course, cows and sheep and even, uh, even working dogs have only got a small area on their noses to perspire and on uh, not being rude, but urinating as well is a way of exporting body heat and also fast respiration. So actual fact, you can actually cook an animal and same with a human being. If you don't have a, a, a good moisture level in your body, you don't, and you, you're hot, you, your body shuts down, your liver, your kidneys uh, will, will, will just stop working. So were there actually quite a lot of fatalities from the drought? No, no very, little, very, very little from the actual uh, heat. Uh, we did have uh, uh, some problems with the facial eczema. That's, that's when you get spores, fungi spores in, on, the, on the pasture when, when they're really eating right down to the ground and uh, the, these spores go into the liver and then block up the, the liver and consequently they die. So we had we some uh, issues because of the drought but uh, very little, well actual fact I don't know of any stock in, the, in my part of the Waikato that actually died from heat extra, extra, um, exhaustion but it is an issue, animal welfare issue uh, for, with droughts is, is a major challenge. So, I mean, how much, how cost, uh, costly is it to treat facial eczema in an animal? Oh, uh, since uh, in, in, since what, the 1980s, uh, zinc has been an, uh, a common uh, medicine that we give the cows. The zinc has molecules and whatever, and when when they drink as uh, too much zinc will kill them. So you give it, you, you try and give them a dose, and this thing goes into the liver itself. An actual fact, the spores attract to that like like a magnet and then they are able to uh, move them out of the body themselves. So we can treat it, but mainly zinc is, the, uh, is one of the medicines we give, animal, animal medicines we give to cows. But also uh, another issue is that they've got plenty of green grass, and then that issue goes away. It's only when it gets dry and humid at the ground and the spores are taken up, yeah. Are there any methods of farming that could be more sustainable? Well, uh, well, I think farmers. I think the man has been sustainable since uh, since he came came on this earth. Uh, we we know that, uh, that they got to a stage that um, they just they had to start growing their own food when the hunting was not e as easy as it used to be. And since uh, early days, we've had farming sustainable. As we're going forward, we have to be more sustainable because the pressure is on us to. To produce, we've had our New Zealand government uh, extol to our primary producers. We've got to get 25% more to feed the world, to keep the world at peace, but also necessary income to New Zealand. So we've got pressures from government. We want more money uh, for the country. We want farmers that want to be sustainable financially uh, to to, uh, to look after their own family. And so we have to be, we have to big impact so that we will be sustainable going forward. As I said before, 2050, 9.5 million, billion, sorry, people on this earth, 7.2 now. We have to be 40% better than what we're doing now. And we can't do that if we are not sustainable. So we will be sustainable all the way through. How do we do that? Good management practices, uh, modern technology. We have got technology coming in, uh, in now. And um, we probably, you, will, you probably will see a lot of, lot of bovines, uh, cows in, house where we can trap the end, trap the all the nutrients uh, I have no doubt that they'll trap all the liquid that's including urine that will, that will get recycled into the ceiling where you have brassicas so you take you you you, you hydroponic feed your cabbages your Brussels sprouts or whatever to bring another food source into the into the system and also export the nitrogen and phosphate off the farm and put it into in, into the food chain so we, so there will be some radical changes. What we can't do in science is emulate what milk and and, and, and grass-fed meat can do. Uh, they can't emulate it. You you see on Star Trek, they can put in a, in a, a little thing, and, it, and you, the meal comes out. That's never going to happen. 
Um, there was recently with the Fonterra's uh, conference, they were talking about inside dairy milking. That's right. Is it, do you think it, it, it was... will happen? It will happen. If we got to increase our production by 40%, we cannot increase our stocking rate on pasture that much. So we've got to bring in technology, technology. You know, um, not the not the old barn stuff you see in, in, old, in old pictures, but modern state of the art that you can have controlled air temperatures, you have controlled environmental issues. And of course, you've got to consider the animal welfare aspect. They've got to have, be, um, have some natural uh, uh, ability as well to, to roam about. But we will start having them uh, in houses. In, in, and they'll be nice houses. They'll be, they'll be up, up market houses compared to what you see now. Coming up next, street art in Hamilton. If you have just joined us, welcome to Central News. Waikato towns have been transformed with large-scale paintings done by street artists. Behind this creative magic is creative Waikato's Paul Bradley. Harriet went to speak with him about these artistic murals popping up and also creative Waikato's event calendar over the Christmas and New Year period. So uh, there's been a whole lot of stuff painted around the Waikato region. So we've got two new ones in Hamilton that have been street art pieces that have gone up, um, just within short walk of Creative Waikato. And there's also recently been some work go in um, to Te Mananui and also in Te Kawiri. And all of those pieces that I'm talking about uh, were done by Eno and Shida who are two graffiti artists. So who are these artists and what's their background? So the, the two artists that have been um, painting these pieces are Eno is one guy and his name is Makaidi Gardner and he at the moment lives in National Park but he's done a whole lot of work around Taranaki, um, New Plymouth um, and Whanganui as well. And he, I don't know a lot about his background actually but, um, but I know that he's a really prol prolific uh, graffiti artist. And he's actually in Melbourne at the moment, I think, painting. The other guy is um, Mick, is his name, and he's, he paints Shida. And Shida lives in Melbourne, but he's actually a Polish guy, yeah. And how did you receive permission for these paintings to go ahead? Yeah, it was an interesting process, actually. So um, it was a combination of uh, approaching council, because obviously around cities and towns, a lot of the walls are owned by council and then talking to business owners as well. But we actually had a really amazing response. Um, lots of willingness for art to go up on walls, so it's very encouraging for future projects. So the artists weren't actually paid for their work, so how was it all funded? Uh, yeah, well, it's quite amazing as a, you know, as a gift to, these, to Hamilton and these other towns. It's, um, they really just wanted to paint, so they were just after walls and they're fortunate, or maybe talented enough to be sponsored by Razine. Um, and really what they were after is just support to make the work happen. So we, um, well the Hamilton Central Business Association, they paid for a cherry picker to help them to get to those really um, high up walls. Um, there was some catering provided by Iguana uh, restaurant, um, security company helped out, kept an eye on their staff. So all sorts of different people came together to help support it. And yeah, mostly these guys, they just wanted to paint walls. So they were kind of self-funding it, which is awesome. But they did pick up a commission as well. So they painted the wall inside Black Sheep, which is a um, web development company. And what has the response from the general public been like? I think uh, on the whole, really positive. I think you're always going to um, challenge people as well. And sometimes people are Particularly, you know, it's kind of new in, in some of these ta Waikato towns to have street art, particularly contemporary stuff. They might be used to the more sort of traditional mural, um, maybe the ones that, you know, tell historical stories and things like that. So it's something that's a bit more cutting edge. Um, you know, some people don't like it, and that's part of it, I guess. Um, but then I always think good art, well, any art is never going to be liked by everyone anyway. So, but generally, really positive. A lot of people are really encouraged that it's happening, and really excited about it. And what would you like to see happen with street art in the future? Uh, well, my personal dream would just be that there's uh, colour and art everywhere. Um, and I think, you know, particularly in the bigger cities, I think they kind of need that kind of stuff to often to balance out the harder edges of cities. 
um, I think less grey walls, less tagging and more high quality art. And, and that's the message I'm getting a lot from people. Yeah. Now tell us about this Huntley project that you've been working on. Yeah, so this is a recent project, really exciting. It was, it came about kind of as a response to um, lots of kind of um, problems, I guess, but it's been a really positive response to that. So uh, it's based on Huntley West, which um, has a lot of tagging and a lot of grey walls that are all kind of patchy, different coloured greys, um, really trying to, just desperately trying to stay on top of, of the tagging problem. And then also a lot of sort of empty shops, so a bit of a depressed feeling in that little township. Um, and the response was to, you know, let's just try filling that little township up with art. Because um, in a way, you've got nothing to lose. So um, I worked with a local artist, a Hamilton artist, Jeremy Shirley, who um, some people might know from doing lots of bus shelters and things like that. And he did a few big pieces on walls. Um, and I did a piece myself, not wearing my creative Waikato hat, but um, just because I wanted to be involved. And yeah, we, and the support from the community was massive, so we just had heaps of people turn out on the day. We kind of outlined all the pieces, but then people were, everything, everyone from little kids to much older people were, were painting um, with us and helping us. And so it was a huge community effort. And is this an ongoing project that's going to be happening perhaps in other towns? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that was kind of a response specific to what was happening in Huntley West, but I think in different ways that's not unusual, that scenario. So, you know, I, it was kind of an experiment, but I think it was really successful. Um, people feel much more pride in their town. Um, amazingly, like the, those pieces have been there for three weeks now and they haven't been tagged, which is, for that area is incredible. So I think, yeah, we'll keep rolling it out and seeing where else we can do it. And if viewers want to find out about key events happening over Christmas and New Year's period, what's the best way that they can go about that? Yeah, so probably the best place to go is to go to the Creative Waikato website, which is just creativewaikato.co.nz, and click on the calendar page, and that's got listings from around the whole Waikato region. It's loads of stuff happening, so it's worth checking out. For more information on the artists and their work, visit ripeno.tumblr.com or find information on the Creative Waikato website. That is Central News for this Monday. Email us, news at tvcentral.co.nz or like us on Facebook and let us know if you have any of your own news. Join me again tomorrow night for more guests from around the Waikato on the Bay of Plenty. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Have a lovely evening. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.